Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. And on behalf of um, UMRE, the UM Research Ethics Committee, um, we ju I'd just like to thank ADAC for organizing um, this session. It's always such a great opportunity to talk to everybody and meet everyone. Um, so our session, as, as noted earlier, is divided into to three parts. Um, I will talk for about 20 minutes to half an hour about our committee and, and you know, just some of the, the issues that maybe we face when we have applicants and, and some of the problems um, or challenge, not challenges, but um, some of the issues that, that arise in relation to the filling out of forms in, in UMREC. And then Dr. Ryder will speak on the fundamental principles of ethics. And Dr. Chai will then go through a really interesting case study. So this is just a bit of a taster session for everybody to, um, to just introduce ourselves to you and maybe to my screen um, now. Yeah? Dr. Shari, I think we lost you for a few seconds. Oh. Uh, I think you, 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 just, you were just about to introduce yourself, right? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. So you didn't... I was uh, no, 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 no. Uh, it's okay. Just uh, continue. <laughs> okay. I so I'll just, seconds, yeah. okay, I'll just go straight into the, the PowerPoint presentation. All right, so um, this is a short introduction to the UMREC. And I will just go through these three things. I will talk about who we are and what our responsibilities are in terms of our committee. I'll then just really quickly um, invite us to think about why is thinking about ethics important prior to data collection? Why do we make such a big deal about needing ethics approval? And then I will talk a little bit about the guidelines and the procedures of an ethics application to UMREC. Quite often in, 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 in the sense that this is what lends um, your application forms back to, to you and, and doesn't get immediate approval. So these are our team, these are our committee members, and you will see that our chair is Professor Lo Wai Yun from the Asia Europe Institute, and our deputy chair is Dr. T Meng Yu from the Faculty of Education. We have um, a reasonably large size committee, um, but then again, we get quite a few applications these days. And the chair and the deputy chair are, are quite mindful, or rather the TNC is quite mindful about um, appointing people from different faculties across the, the university. And um, we meet once a month to go through applications. We also have two lay representatives, Dato Adinan Bin Maning and Ms. Agnes Tan Mio. And our lay representatives are a very important part of our committee um, because they bring an independent perspective to the work that we do. And our responsibilities, we applications for ethics approval for research involving human participants, um, non-clinical research. So every month we go through um, all the, the, the research applications and, and Puan Zaza, our administrator, does quite a, a lot of work in, in vetting the the forms in the first round and then sending them out to us and reminding us to send them back and we look through them and then we have a meeting. So, and it's important because we, we feel that we need to ensure that all um, research involving human participants in non-clinical research conforms to recognized ethical standards. So we don't just make up the standards as we go along. There are these internationally and nationally recognized standards. And we try and make sure that when the research applicants send in their application forms, um, we, we try and, and, and make sure that the research adheres to these standards. Um, we also are very committed to establishing and supporting good research ethics practices uh, because the best we feel that the best way to get um, people to really engage in ethics in their research projects is to really embed it in them that, you know, when we feel committed to doing ethics as individual researchers, then the battle is won, right? Then at, uh, the dream is that one day you won't even need UMREC to do a lot of work because all the applications that come in are so well thought out. And obviously, because we, we deal with a lot of, of research protocols and, and forms, we store and update records and we safeguard all private and confidential matters discussed during the UMREC meetings and activities, because sometimes we, um, we get quite a lot of confidential detail. And I think this is really important to, 
to think about why is it important to think about ethics prior to conducting research involving human participants? Are we just making a lot of fuss about something that is not important at all? And I would suggest that the value or the importance of thinking about research ethics is really um, researchers. Because if our research projects embed good ethics in it, they are likely to contribute to good research outcomes. So if our methodology is good, um, if we are actually thinking about questions in a good way, if we're actually in thinking about the interests and the needs of our participants, chances are that the results that we get are going to be good results. And obviously, it's valuable to us as researchers because it is increasingly becoming a prerequisite for publications. Um, Many, I'm, oh, I think my internet's a bit unstable. I'm just going to um, switch off my video so that hopefully my internet is a bit more stable. Um, so it's, it's important because in most instances, publications will not publish your research findings unless you have prior ethics approval if your research involves human participants. So it, you know, as academics, it's almost um, necessary in It's obviously very valuable to participants because, you know, I think as, as we understand research and, and as we think about how we work with our participants, we realize that research shouldn't be something we do to somebody. They're not guinea pigs that we go out there, we use them and then we leave them, right? We are actually partners in research. And it's so important for us to think about research ethically because then the participants feel valued as partners in research. It's also really important because if we think about the harms and the risks and what we, we should do in order to protect or, or what are the possible risks that our participants may face. We are thinking about these things before they happen. So we can put into place, um, you know, referral pathways or we can amend our protocols a little bit to ensure that we protect our participants. And that's really valuable because once you've harmed participants or once their information has been disclosed and they're angry, you can't turn back the clock. And thinking about it beforehand is so important. Such protocols involving refugee populations or marginalized populations, indigenous populations, or even uh, people that, that live in um, the PPR flats, the, the poor communities. It's so important that we build partnerships with them. If they, as communities, think that we come in to help them, if our research questions are questions that are important to them, we build partnerships and we are also able to strengthen communities and to do work with them. And that's just so valuable. And really thinking about benefits and thinking about equitable benefit sharing is, is so valuable in, in dealing with communities and helping them to help themselves as well. And it not only helps the immediate participants and researchers, doing research ethics well is so important for other researchers and for any future research that we might want to do because it builds trust. If we don't do our research well, if participants think, oh, we can't really trust researchers, they just come and take what they want or they... And we are never going to work with researchers again. So later on, if you want to go back and work with the same participants or participants who have heard about the research that you do, you may find it very difficult. And, and this is really valuable to build trust between participants, communities and researchers so that we can then carry on and do better research and more research. And ultimately, and, and I think you don't even need to justify this, it is just the right thing to do, right? To think about the ethics before you start research, it's just the right thing to do. So I'll just quickly go through the ethics review process with you now. Um, we really only look at non-clinical or non-medical research. The clinical and medical research goes through um, the Faculty of Medicine's um, UMMC Research Ethics Committee. Um, we primarily look at non-clinical research um, on subjects that does not have clinical in implications. Um, it does not contribute to the management of human, physical, or mental diseases or health conditions.
in art, social sciences, business, education, engineering, law. Um, sometimes we look at security sensitive material and we think about that very carefully. If the military, if you're doing research with the military or, or with military personnel, and if you are collecting or using personal but non-medical information, test results, household information, and if you are conduct collecting non-invasive measurements to learn about normal human responses. And this is the type of, of research protocols that we will look at. Um, when we look through the, your research project, we look at a variety of things. We look at methodology because good methodology is good research. If you are if your methodology is really bad, then it is not ethical because you are asking the participants to give off their time or sometimes you're putting them at risk, even though it's low risk, for no good result. Bad methodology means that it is bad research and the results are probably not going to be very good and therefore it is not justifiable. To look at how you recruit participants, um, your recruitment procedures, we look at um, the issues of consent from participants or guardians. We consider confidentiality or the anon anonymity of participants, whether when you're conducting your research, you protect the confidentiality. And we consider how you gather data, how it is handled and how it is stored. So all these questions are specifically asked um, about in our application forms. Our standard operating procedure um, in week one, there is a pre-screen. So you hand, if you hand in your, your forms before the deadline, uh, Puan Zaza, our administrator, pre-screens everything to ensure that forms are correctly filled in and she decides which applications go in for normal or expedited review. If your application really is a very, very minimal risk and you're not really engaging with human participants in any sort of meaningful way, there's a possibility that you get you can ask for expedited review or if there's a very pressing issue. So for instance, very quickly, um, it was possible for us to um, look at these um, review processes in an expedited manner. And, you know, Puan Zaza really does a, a great job and, and she filters things, not because she wants to make life difficult for everybody, but because if they're filtered well and they come to the ethics review, they then stand a much better chance of just being passed immediately and we don't end up sending them back to you. So it's always a good idea um, to, to take on board anything that the administrator tells you at the pre-screening. And then in week one, it goes for ethics review. If it's expedited, one reviewer does it be between one week to two weeks and you get your response. Normal review, the reviewers are given um, three weeks to look through all the research protocols. In week four, we have a meeting where we decide once and for all which are, are to be approved, which need um, revision, and then the result is sent to the researchers. If any protocol revision is required, uh, it goes back to the applicants. Um, the review panel, the person the feedback and revisions, and hopefully that lands up with an ethics approval, and approval is given for three years. So it's, it's quite a... a, a you know, intensive process, uh, but I think we have an, a great administrator and it tends to work reasonably well. These are the ethics application submissions. Um, all the forms are available on our website and you email your application to umrec at um.edu.my. This is our webpage where you can find all the information that you need. And if you need any further information, you are welcome to email us and um, we will get back to you. So these are just some of the problems that we encounter when we are looking through application forms, just to highlight some of these issues. Um, missing supporting documentation. So, you know, if you don't put in the documentation, we can't review it and we need to get back to you to say, well, this is not filled in and everything gets delayed, right? So if you need a, to put in a questionnaire that of department signature, the supervisor's signature, the consent forms need to be there, the participant information sheets. Um, sometimes people prov provide very vague descriptions of research objectives and processes. So it's hard for us to know whether or not the risks are high or low if we don't really know a detail of, of what you're going to do or what your objectives are and whether if you are trying to achieve a certain objectives, 
this level of, of risk or benefit is appropriate to that particular objective. Um, cutting and pasting from the research proposal um, to communicate the study to members of the general public is really not very good. So we will ask you for your research proposal and that can be written in fairly technical detail. But later on, when you fill up your participant information sheet, um, you really need to think carefully about who are our participants? What are their ages? What, are, what groups do they come from? What languages do they speak? Do they understand this information? And just cutting and pasting from the research proposal, all this technical ways will land up with um, the proposal being sent back to you and you'll be asked to um, you know, fill out the form in a, in a way that lay people understand. A very generic participant information sheet and consent form. Again, you know, what is the point of your participation information sheet? It's so that your participants know what is going to happen step by step. Um, so you really want to be able to explain to them what is going to happen. And this is just a part of respecting them. And they feel valued and they feel that they're partners with you in the research uh, as opposed to you just tell them something very general and expect them to trust you. Use of jargon and acronyms, again, that you know, is, is part of the problem when you, if researchers at least just pick up sections from their research protocol and put them into the participant information sheet or consent form, and that's really not fair to your participants because um, how are they supposed to understand it? Failure to show how data will be kept and disposed after the research ended. So data is really important these days. To, to misuse data or just if data is in the wrong hands, the release of data can be so harmful. We see this all the time. So we are quite um, careful about wanting to know how researchers are going to ma manage data. If participant recruitment is not clear, who will you include? Who will you exclude? And these raise issues of justice. Have you unfairly included somebody that really is unable to benefit or is at very high risk? Or have you excluded people simply because it's too difficult and excluding them will actually lead to a less good research um, outcome and therefore the whole um, research process is not really well run. Um, it's important to define the incentives or remunerations given to participants. Uh, one of the things we are concerned about is that people are coerced, not so much coerced, but there's undue influence that um, if, if the remunerations are too high, people will be willing to take risks that are unwarranted. And this is important. And, and this really goes back to, I think, being a good researcher and caring about your participants, thinking about who they are, where they are, the risks that they may, um, you know, be subjected to in the context that they live and I think our case study later on will really bring this out to the fore, that good researchers really try and do their due diligence to understand the participants of the communities that they are working with. Um, and for instance, the social and economic vulnerability of the participants, um, the undue influence you may have over your participants. So for instance, if you are a lecturer and you are trying to do research with your students, to think about Issues such as, are the students really able to say no? Or will saying no be so hard for them because they feel that I'm their, research, um, I'm their lecturer and I may mark them down? How do I manage my recruitment process so that the students don't feel that they have to accept this invitation to participate? Um, sometimes research, especially when you're working with maybe refugee populations or students or homeless populations, and you're going through NGOs or gatekeepers who control access to the participants of their data, um, it's so important to get pre-approval from them even before you come to us so that we know you've spoken to the right people and the right people have actually said, okay, this research is safe to be run in our community or with the people that we work with. Um, so again, define incentives, um, no approval, data sharing. Um, again, if you are sharing your data with any third party outside the University of Malaya, it's really important for us that um, there is an agreement with other parties involved. 
that it is something that is agreed with and that this information is also going to be kept secure by those other parties. And I think probably one of the worst things you can, a, a researcher can try and do is do the research first and then come and a no-brainer. We will not approve eth, um, studies which have already been conducted because that is really unethical for us to say, okay, well, you've already done it. We'll give you the ethics approval. Ethics approval has to be prior to the research. Um, so that's really, really important to come to us before you start your research. And, and so then this leads to the million dollar question, right? How do I avoid these problems? How do I write my research protocol in a way that is mindful of the needs and interests of the participants? How do I think about risks and how do I think about benefits in a way that is meaningful again? What do I do when I write my participant information sheet? What should I be thinking of? Um, what is UMREC or what are the UMREC reviewers thinking of when they're looking at our applications? And um, the answers or rather the beginning presentation where she will go through some of the, the basic ethical principles and that's a good place to start. So I think if you start by thinking about all these basic ethical principles when you're writing your research protocol, when you're thinking about your research and, and filling out all your forms and, and writing your, your questionnaires, um, you're probably 90% of the way to a really, really sound um, protocol in terms of the, the research ethics of it. Um, so we have like five minutes if you have any specific questions for me. I'm sorry, my internet connection is not very stable today. Um, so if you have any questions before Dr. Ryder's session, um, either just raise your hands and I, I'll call you and, and you can um, shout out your questions. No, nobody has any questions at this point. Okay, um, so maybe we'll I'll introduce you. Yep, so I'll introduce you. Is that okay? Oh, sorry, Sharon. We can't hear you what you said just now. That's what that's why I didn't answer you. Oh, okay. Yikes, I'm sorry. It's my just a few seconds, so okay, there's like a delay. Yeah. Okay, okay. So I'll just introduce you and I'll hand it over to you. Sure. I'll share my screen meanwhile. Okay. So um, I'm very happy this morning to introduce Dr. Ryder, who will go through the fundamental principles of research ethics. Dr. Ryder is a senior lecturer in the Department of Business Policy and Strategy at the University of Malaya. And her research interests lie in the areas of organizational behavior, um, specifically employee engagement, well-being, and work-home conflict. Um, Ryder has been a member of our University Malaya Research Ethics Committee for Ethics. Uh, she is also a member of the Malaysian Institute of Human Resource Management and has collaborated actively with the public and private sectors in several research projects and she's worked with the Ministry of Entrepreneur and Cooperative Development Malaysia, the Malaysia Productivity Corporation, the Master Builder Association of Malaysia, and the National Institute of Public Administration. She's worked with Intan, and, and these are just some of the people that she's worked with. Um, so she's done a lot of research and is really well placed um, to give you this introduction to the fundamental principles. And so I, I welcome Ryder, and we will take questions at the end of Dr. Ryder's presentations. So you can either keep those questions to yourself and raise your hands at the end, or if you just want to write them in the chat, I'll ask um, them to her orally. So over to you, Ryder. Thanks so much, Sharon. Thanks for that amazing um, introduction. I don't know where you get that information from, but thank you very much. 
Um, so I guess my job today is to talk about the fundamental principle of research ethics. So assalamualaikum and very go- good morning to everyone. And uh, my job here today is to answer or to reflect back on the problems encountered while we're doing all the research ethics forms and um, approval. Um, so hopefully, like what Sharon mentioned just now, um, hopefully by understanding and being aware of these principles, um, we sort of know what to be aware about, what is harmful for uh, the participants. So. I guess what we want to do today is to understand the basic principles and then we probably are going to become more aware of the do's and don'ts based on those principles. Okay, so I know today we all come from a very diverse background, right? All of us are actually working on, you know, different sort of research and our research concern um, it's more about understanding what's going on out there. You know, so we try to understand uh, people's experience, perceptions, um, their moods, their behavior. So we probably go through a, a similar kind of experience in the process of collecting data. And I guess for the most of us, we do look into research that focus on human participants. And if you look at the slide, um, if, you, if you look at this iceberg, uh, when we conduct research, right, um, the things that is above the iceberg is the easier thing to do. So what happened is that we're very much trained to do this in terms of methodology. So we go out there, we send survey out, we ask questions, we observe people, you know, we conduct interview and experiments. So we're actually trained to do that. So we might feel that, yes, I'm on the right track, but while we are actually motivated to do all this research, we sometimes let go of um, the other important aspect, which is the ethical side. And that's the one that is below the iceberg. So question of ethical issues would rise, such as, uh, do you actually you know, harm, anyone, harm anyone while carrying out your research activities? Um, were you fair you know, at identifying potential relevant participants? Did you look at everyone you know, in the population? Um, were the participants' rights protected? So these are just some of the issues. And I guess we need to become a bit more thoughtful and we need to become a, a more of a critical observer of our fieldwork experience. And then hopefully that would help us to become more conscientious and a bit more alert on the safety and the well-being of the participant. And... Um, in reality, I think all of us know this already, what is acceptable, what is morally right and wrong. So research ethics are there to serve as a guidelines, right? Um, and it, it involves all these applications of the principles which I'm going to talk about today to, uh, to help us to deal with the participants, uh, to help us to deal with other researchers, as well as society in general. And um, I guess when it comes to doing research, um, the main agenda of any research should be this, that the welfare of any participant within a research study should always, always take precedence over the advancement of science. And if we have taken this approach as a starting point of our research, uh, hopefully it would not be too difficult to internalize the basic principles of research ethics, right? So we have to have that in mind uh, as we're conducting our research. So today I will talk about these four fundamentals, which are autonomy, beneficence, justice, and integrity. Um, and these are the four things that you need to consider as you're filling out your forms, as you're conducting your research. Um, but I will be focusing more on the first two, which is autonomy and beneficence, simply because there are more things that needs to be considered under that particular principle. So the first one is autonomy. Um, and this is really about the respect for person, right? Um, it is really about the rights and dignity of, um, you know, individuals. Um, they should have been able to make their own choice on whether to participate or not. And this concept of no coercion is more about um, that they should not be pressured, that everything should be voluntary, right? And coercion usually happens when there is a threat, there is a harm, um, and usually it's intentionally presented because researcher wants to obtain compliance from the participant. So you want to increase your response rate, and therefore coercion happens, right? And sometimes there's also this form of pressure. So this is the one that Sharon mentioned just now where, you know, it usually occurs when there is a position uh, of authority. So maybe between a, a boss to a subordinate, a teacher 
to a student, right? Where the potential participant might feel that, you know, it's really, you know, I really need to participate or not. You know, my, my lecturer would say something about it or my teacher would say something about it. So the potential participant feel very obligated to participate, um, in which case it is no longer voluntary, right? Um, and the third point that I have here, which is undue influence. Now, this is really about offering excessive rewards. This is really about giving the inappropriate sort of rewards, again, to obtain compliance, to increase the response rate. Um, now, don't get me wrong, um, no coercion or this concept of undue influence, it does not mean that you cannot give incentive, right? But it does mean that whatever incentive that you want to give uh, to the participant should actually commensurate with whatever time, with whatever effort that you would expect from the participant. So it must, in a sense, make, make sense. And it, in a sense, it should not be too extreme that it would look like something like a bribe or a very inappropriate inducement. And that's why we require um, in the uh, UMREC form that uh, you know, if you were to give incentive, what sort of incentive could it be? So we can actually look into it and see whether, you know, it is appropriate or inappropriate, All right? Um, another thing about um, respect for person is to treat people as autonomous. We need to provide them with complete information about our study. So this is really about, you know, what's the purpose of your study? And the one thing that we always see in the forms or in the participation information sheet is that um, the information is very much technical. So it's not in layman sort of term. And what happened is it just might be that the, the participant would not understand what is going on. Right. So we use a lot of academic sort of words in there. And then when it comes to the final participant, they're not really academicians. So it's very hard for them uh, to understand um, the, your introduction and your purpose of study. So you need to take back, uh, you know, um, and look at your information a little. And so make it a bit more general so that the participant would actually understand it. So. Again, the information should include the research procedure, the purpose. If I can show you, um, can you see it on my slide, the form? If any, if ad, anyone from EDET can confirm. Um, yes, we can see your with. Okay, thank you. All right, so you know this is a form of the cover letter or the participant participants information sheet. So of course it would um, include all those um, investigator. And then you have a bit of introduction, right? Not a very lengthy one. Uh, you write the purpose of the study and you have to let them know about the study procedure in great detail, in a sense. And uh, the participation in the study. So somewhere along the forms, you know, you need to say that it's completely voluntary and you should provide what is the benefit to the study for the participant or what are the risks that could involve, right? Um, you have to ensure them in terms of confidentiality and of course, you know, if there's any complaint, who should they actually contact? So something like that, all right? And um, if you look at the third point, I suppose that another thing that we should consider is whether your, again, like I said just now, whether your participation information sheet or your uh, cover letter is actually understandable. Did we consider the participant's age? Did we consider their experience? Did we consider their literacy level? And so it's not just the information that you put in the participant information sheet, right? It is also, um, in a sense, the manner and the context in which the information is actually being conveyed. So for example, if you're conducting an interview and you would like to give a briefing to the participant, um, but you have actually presented the information rather too quickly because you know this inside out, right? So you said it out loud very, very quickly or maybe in a format that is rather confusing to the participant. So that might affect the participant's ability to make an informed decision, right? Because they don't understand what's going on. So what happened is that the case of being autonomous, it, it, it's no longer there. Right? So this is something that we need to think about. First is the information. The second is how is the information being conveyed? Okay. Um, 
another element of autonomy is their their rights to withdraw the participants right to withdraw so they must know that they can withdraw anytime and uh, somewhere along the line or in one of the you know cover letter or in the consent form there must be a statement somewhere offering the participant the opportunity to withdraw so even though you might think that you know, the data is important, you know, you conduct the interview, this is a very important data. Uh, a few weeks later, the, the participant calls you up and say, you know what, um, I'm not feeling good about it and I changed my mind, uh, please take me out. So you have to remove that, we have to abide by that by their request and remove that particular data, no matter how important that data is, right? That's um, our job as a researcher. Um, and respect for person also means ensuring confidentiality, the second point. Right. And this is really protecting protecting them in all, uh, you know, private information and, you know, all their personal views. And what this really means is that we really have this responsibility as a researcher to make a judgment about what should be reported and what should not be publicly disclosed. So, for example, the fact that something was revealed to the researcher um, does not automatically entitle the researcher to make it public. So then what happened is confidentiality must uh, be protected. Um, and this is something that we really need to um, look into and um, take seriously, right? The third one is data pr protection. So uh, like what Dr. Sharon mentioned just now, it's really about managing your data. So because confidentiality is an issue, so we need to ensure that uh, the data is uh, stored securely somewhere um, and it's very safe and it's not, uh, as, and it's actually safe from, from unauthorized access. Okay. All right. So respect for person also means protecting those with diminished autonomy. So this includes, um, you know, those marginalized population, vulnerable population. So for example, young children, people who are quite ill, people with mental disabilities and so forth. And these people should be protected and only, only be included in the research if it's necessary, you know, under specific circumstances, right? Um, and this is uh, the reason being is that they cannot make a true informed decision on their own. And of course, this situation requires them or requires us, sorry, as a researcher to seek permission of other parties um, in order to protect them. So in the case of young children, we might ask their parents. And hopefully, hopefully, um, these are the parties who actually represent the participants' best interests. At least that's what we hope, all right? Now, that's uh, the first concept, which is autonomy. The second fundamental principle of ethics is beneficence. So beneficence is really just often understood as um, an obligation or our responsibility to do good. Non-maleficence is the duty not to do bad. So under this, there are three uh, specific principles, which is not to do harm to anyone. The second, one, the second one is to maximize as much benefits that we can to the participant. And the third one is that we should try as much as possible to minimize the risk for participants. So I'm going to talk about this a bit in greater detail. So the first one is do no harm. Now, if we don't want to do any harm, the first thing that we need to do is, you know, to know what is harmful. So in order to avoid harms, it really requires us to know what is harmful. So there are many problems that occur during research, but for today, I'm just gonna concentrate on these six, uh, which is physical harm, psychological, social, economic, legal, and dignitary. So I'm gonna just go through them very briefly uh, and just give an example. So the first one is physical harm from research, right? And this can include you know, things like pain, discomfort, um, suffering, injury, or even it might, it might also be death. So for example, in a biomedical sort of research where individuals would feel um, a discomfort because they have to sit still or lay still for a very long time uh, during an MRI session. So that's a form of physical harm. And we need to know whether we had actually minimized the risk for the participant and whether we have consent from them. The next um, thing about uh, harm is psychological harm. Um, this is when 
uh, the the participants uh, would actually reflect back on themselves and they would have some sort of negative self-perception on themselves and they would feel anxiety, maybe even emotional suffering or being embarrassed or shameful about something. So, for example, um, if you're working on topics like a hostile working environment, right, a toxic working environment, and you ask the participant to answer a survey about agreeing to some hateful statement about their working environment, what happened is that the person would actually recall a lot of negative moments at work. And um, when they recall that, now that feeling could range from a very minimal sort of anxiety uh, to an intense sort of psychological distress, right? So we need to, to be prepared about this. We need to be aware of this psychological harm that could occur and the extent that it might occur as we're conducting our research, okay? Um, the third form of harm is social harm. This occur when it involves a negative impact uh, on the relationship as well as um, the interactions uh, with other people. And um, this is actually the result of the research. So one of uh, the things that could occur there is that there's a breach of confidentiality, right? So somehow somebody said something about the participant, uh, what the participant said during the interview process. And um, or something that she or he might wrote in the survey. So what happened is that the participants' answer become known to certain people, and this can actually cause a lot of stigmatization, right? So stigmatization is another form of social harm. And so let me give you an example. So let's say um, a student particip participate in school bullying sort of study because um, uh, they were being bullied or have some experience in it or they want to talk about it. And then suddenly everyone knows, right? Everyone in school knows about it and it becomes viral and people actually talk about it in social media. So this is a form of social harm that could occur. And we need to somehow predict on, on the extent of whether it, is it going to happen? What are the things that I'm going to do in my research to avoid from this kind of thing to happen. The next one is economic harms. So the first economic harms is, I guess, in terms of financial loss. Um, you know, um, you might conduct a focus group study and you ask people to come over, uh, but you don't really provide them with a transportation cost. So the transportation cost would be a financial loss to them. Or perhaps they need a babysitter to, to babysit their children while they go while they participate in the focus group, that is also a form of financial loss. Um, however, uh, another form of harm which is a bit more serious is that, that part of confidentiality and the disclosure of uh, the participants' findings. So let's say um, an employee take part in your research um, and suddenly the boss found out later on that you I mean, say the topic is on leadership and the employee keeps on complaining about the leadership at the organization. And then suddenly the boss found out and um, you lose your job because of that. Yeah, the participants lose your, their job because of that. So that's a form of economic harms that could occur. The next one is legal harm. So this includes a lot of things like arrest, conviction, particularly if you're working on... Um, um, issues like sexual assault, uh, the possession of illegal drugs, right, shoplifting behavior. So um, such a harm can actually result from the breach of confidentiality again. So let me give you an example. Say you're doing a, a domestic violence sort of study and you found out that the wife is being abused. So the question is, should we report this to the police or not? Should we report it? Um, and if the victim does not give consent, essentially you cannot report it, right? Because the victim, victim do not want to report it. So sometimes this depends on the state or the tort law within a particular country sometimes. So we have to go back to that. The last type of harm is dignitary harm. So this is when um, individuals are actually being treated as a means to an end, right? So um, they're not being treated because of their personal views or we have some respect over their own perspective, but it's really about, um, you know, diplomatic sort of issues. It can be because of diplomatic issues. So, and sometimes, just sometimes, uh, such a harm can happen because we do not really appropriately uh, obtain an informed consent. So we don't ask them to sign whatsoever, right? So that's even worrying. 
Um, so, for example, if you're studying immigrant, just to improve the relationship and build better connection uh, between two countries, for instance. So it's not so much to help the immigrants, but it's just to build this connection between the two countries. So that is a form of dignitary harm. All right. So looking at all those harms that we talk about just now, then the question would be, how do we actually balance the risk of harm and uh, the benefit that the participants could be gain, could gain from uh, our research? So there are four things that we need to consider. The first and foremost is we need to determine our procedure, right? We need to determine the specific research protocol. So you must ensure that whatever procedure that you have chosen will not harm the participant. So um, I'm taking the same example. Um, if we're going to conduct an interview for that domestic abuse sort of victim, it would be very, very risky for us to actually conduct uh, the interview at the victim's home. It's risky for the victim. It is also risky for us as a researcher. So the procedure must be thought uh, out from the very beginning. Um, and that's why in the, in the ethics form, we actually ask, ask um, how are you going to recruit the participants? And a lot of people just say, yep, I'm going to take people from Klang Valley. It's not, it, so, you know, it's, it's more than that. It is really how you're going to recruit them and, uh, you know, and then the question of who comes in as well. Um, the second one is the type and extent of harm. So this is about not exposing the participant to danger, of course, and there must be no adverse consequences to the participant. So let's say for the employee just now, if they do co uh, complain a lot about the leadership, right, they, they're not happy with the leadership within an organization, um, you cannot actually guarantee that they will not lose their job if their, their leaders actually find out. So our job, as a researcher, we need to actually minimize all those risks by addressing the, that, that concept of confidentiality. So making sure that they're all anonymous, making sure that there's, there's a lot of measure to minimize that risk. And these measures must be spelled out in the um, UMREC form. Yeah. The third one is the probability and the likelihood, likelihood of that harm. Um, so sometimes risk, uh, when doing research, it can cause the person to reflect on you know, their personal issues so they can get very agitated, they can have um, emotional distress. So we need to determine um, how likely is that going to happen. And it is our obligation as a researcher, I guess, to ensure that you know, whatever communication, whatever interaction that we have with the participants uh, is conducted very, very carefully, right? So we need to think about what are the questions am I going to ask? And then we need to think about what if this thing happened, right? What if they got distressed? Do we have a referral pathway ready? So that's why when you're conducting a um, very sensitive issue, we often ask for a referral pathway. And those are the contacts of a psychologist or a counselor to have them ready. So in case anything happened during the research, we can call them up and we can actually refer the participant to them so that you know, they, they, they're gonna, they can actually attend a follow-up assistance or some counseling. Okay, the fourth one is the benefits that is likely to obtain from participating. Okay, so um, um, there are two types. So what are the benefits? Um, it could be divided into direct benefits and indirect benefits. So I think for the most of us, we usually um, provide indirect benefit. That's when we read a lot of literature and then we, we you know, um, try to find the gaps and I want to contribute a specific um uh, area or I want to contribute in a specific topics. So what happened with that is that we made a conclusion and therefore that particular conclusion can have a lot of practical implications for the industry. Now, on the other hand, you could also have, you know, benefits that are rather direct. So when the study procedure includes benefits such as, you know, the opportunity to learn while doing the research as a participant, or if they could get gain access to certain information, that would be direct benefits. So I put here as an example, um, you know, um, when you're interviewing your participants about the financial incentive that is being given by the governments during the pandemic, right? And you want to know whether it has helped them or not. Now, in case some of the participants did not know about it, what we can do is that we can actually talk about the incentive, the financial incentive, and then later on, we could actually ask, what do you think about this? Do you think that it will help you? So 
in essence, learning about this can be very, very meaningful to the participant. And that would be a form of direct benefits to the participant. Okay, but most of us will probably get involved with a lot of indirect benefit. So I suppose when we look at beneficence, the duty to do good, and non-maleficence, the duty not to do bad, we're actually trying to protect two people, okay, or maybe more than two. So the first party is the participant, the second party is actually the researcher. So on the participant side, I talked about that just now already. Uh, so this is really about having a plan ready on distress man management. Do you have a referral pathway ready? Is the counselor ready? Is the psychologist ready? Right now, the second thing is about researcher. So um, we also need to look at what occur to us as a researcher. Um, so, for example, if you're doing a study in uh, you know away from home in some village or some mountains, I don't know, um, but you're not familiar with that sort of surrounding. You're not familiar with the people there. What are the risks involved? So you know a lot of debriefing must. Uh, be put in so you need to discuss a lot about uh, what will happen before you actually go into that okay and I guess the ultimate sort of um, purpose is to ensure that no one suffer from any hardship uh, from any discrimination or any stigmatization as a consequence of having participated in the research okay um, the last dimension of beneficence um, is that we should target to have as minimal risk as possible. And this, um, this is really, really looking into the intensity of the harm as well as the duration of the harm. So if the research only costs participant like uh, a very short annoyance or a very mild anxiety, so it, it could be very minimal uh, risk. But if it's uh, a very long lasting sort of distress, then it would be greater than minimal risk, all right? Um, maybe I'll give an example. I'm quite sure you have answered some of the survey that is really, really long, right? So the items are many and that the survey are, probably annoys us as a respondent. Now, even if most or even if all of us get really annoyed with that particular survey, there is very minimal risk, okay? Um, so again, as you're doing your research, you need to actually look into, is this a minimal risk or is it greater than minimal risk? So consider this just to reflect back on autonomy and beneficence. So let's say during the pandemic, um, you know, the government wanted to do a study among teachers because they're working from home and to see whether they're stressed or not. Um, and he, they send out the headmaster from each school to actually employ and handle the survey. All right. And the goal was to find out whether, you know, these teachers actually experience challenges or stress. And there is an open-ended question that talk about please describe how you experience stress at work. So going back on the concept of beneficence and autonomy that we talked about just now, whether there's any risk, whether there's any harm associated here, right? And for sure, we can say that there might be some sort of psychological discomfort. Another thing to consider is whether, is there any implicit pressure from the headmaster, right? Are the teacher's right protected? Which means that, you know, some teachers, for example, they might perceive that uh, participating in the survey is actually necessary for them to remain on a good terms with the, uh, with the headmaster, right? And that would be a cause of undue influence. Um, and then in any repercussion, if they don't participate, are the teachers coerced? So we need to ask these sort of questions. Um, what are the procedures to encourage the participant to take part, right? Um, and this might then again, raise a lot of potential harm, okay? Uh, one of the reasons is because um, they might be so motivated because they feel uh, motivated to answer the survey because they feel that just perhaps uh, if I answer this survey, then my KPI at the end of the year will actually look very good. And this will introduce that concept of beneficence. Um, so where they just, they just answer anyway, they don't think about the stress that they might face as they're answering the questionnaire. Okay, so it's not that they want to do it or they want to participate, it's because of that undue influence and it's because of this concept that we talk about just now, like all this beneficence that ask them to actually participate. So then we have to question ourselves whether, you know, is this the right procedure, all right, is this the right thing to do? 
All right. Um, the third one is justice. So I'm just going to go through justice and the last uh, principle uh, a bit briefly. Um, so justice is really, uh, when, when you take a, a look at the core principle of justice, this is really about equal treatment. All right. Um, and as a researcher, we have this ethical responsibility um, to, to ensure that all individuals, all groups are uh, included in the research, at least the relevant one, right? So for example, um, if some participant is excluded because of the issue of language, then as a researcher, we must have a genuine attempt to get a translator or if it's in the case of survey, get a translation services so that that participant could actually take um, part in the survey. So if the problem is the cost to participate, then perhaps we need to think about the transportation costs as they come into our focus group discussion. So maybe a payment to offset that cost or some form of incentive, right? So I think Dr. Sharon also mentioned about this, the, uh, the inclusivity and you know whose group being is excluded, excluded is being asked inside the survey. And this is important for this concept of justice, we want to know that when we actually find respondents, that everyone would have equal treatment, uh, at, at least those who are relevant to, this, to the study. Okay. Um, and I guess I want to ask this question, are we guilty of this? So instead of focusing on participants that are directly related to the problem being studied, some participants are actually systematically selected simply because of easy access. Right, and sometimes because of their compromised position, so because they are subordinate of someone, or if they are our students, for example, right, it's easier to send a survey to our students rather than you know in in, in other places, right? So this again, you know, uh, comes in the form of whether there's justice or not. So people should not be merely included because um, the population is easy to access, right? So for example, if you're working on strategic management sort of changes or issues. Um, and then we thought that, well, I'm just going to ask the lower level managers because um, it's easier to ask them than the top level managers because they're more busy. So that's not a fair treatment to everyone in relation to the topic at hand, right? So the, the selection of uh, the participants must be scrutinized, all right? Uh, you cannot really look into easy access and compromise position. So another thing just to consider, um, if we're doing a recycling research, um, so the survey is about recycling, uh, it, the survey about recycling is distributed to the community who are given recycled bins. Um, so my question would be, how about those communities that do not receive it? Are we assuming that they do not recycle? So I guess it goes back to the topic. So if the topic is more about sustainability of uh, the recycling bins, then it makes more sense to send a survey to those who have been provided with the bins. But if the study is about recycling practice, then we're not being fair to other participants or other potential participants in our selection process. So that's a concept of justice on its own. And the last fundamental principle is actually on integrity. Um, so research should be designed, it should be reviewed and undertaken with uh, you know, the right standards of integrity, making sure that all integrity are met, the quality and transparency are actually assured. So one of the ways to do this is really by caring about you know, ethics. Um, so it's as simple as that. And by acting on that concern alone. So since much of what we do is actually that under that iceberg, right? The iceberg that I show you at the beginning of the uh, uh, the slide. Um, so much of what we do is under that actually. So we know that no one is watching. There's a lot of space to conduct ourselves in a very improper way. Um, so we need to go back and we need to take a look into what is our responsibility? What is our accountability? Right? Um, and then another thing about um, integrity is that we should really be mindful of the local norms, right? So what not to do, what to do in the local environment, um, so respect for norms is a reflection of our integrity as a researcher and our responsibility of a researcher. Um, so for example, so for example, if you're studying um, how people uh, understand spirituality, 
right, from a different religious point of view, then what are the procedures to enter a mosque? What are the procedures to enter a church? Would it be different from Muslims and non-Muslims for other researchers from, for different, uh, from different backgrounds? So basically, when we talk about integrity, this is really about the steps that we have taken to ensure that we are responsible researchers. I am, I'm just listing, listing out some of the unacceptable practice um, in relation to integrity, but there are many, right? There are many. Um, so some of it would be the fabrication of uh, false data. So creation of new data, falsification and distortions of data, uh, the concept of plagiarism and um, not admitting some data are missing. So there are many of them, right? Um, but this is, again, a reflection of our integrity, whether we're going to take a look at this and make it available and avoiding all this. And the last part, um, in terms of um, uh, integrity, is this conflict of interest. So when we talk about the conflict of interest, this is really about um, our obligation as a researcher to the funder or to the institution who's giving the money to conduct research totally independently, right? Um, but somehow that could be compromised. And this can happen because, you know, you want to obtain a personal gain or you might have commitment to some people or to the funder. Um, you might have a, a person, a, a, an obligation to um, a person with a potential influence. So there's a lot of these ethical issues when we talk about conflict of interest. And as again, um, as a researcher, as a responsible researcher, we need to... Uh, we need to ensure that independence of research could, uh, should be very, very clear, that any conflicts of interest or partial, uh, partial conflict of interest should be very, very explicit from the beginning. So as you're signing for that uh, sponsorship, you need to think about what are the things that I can do, what are the things that I can't do. So read through the agreements and make sure that there's no conflict of interest, right? Um, and that's the reason why we have included this in the form as well, just to, to see whether if you're being funded and you're aware that, you know, there's no conflict of interest um, going on, okay? And in some cases, we do find that there's a conflict of interest. So... Essentially, when we talk about the principle or the fundamental principle of ethics, we have covered many different aspects, right? Um, and in reality, we're talking about location, time, the target participants, and the incentive. Um, so we look into where to do it, and then we look into this concept of justice and that concept of inclusivity of the participant. Um, how should you look into the procedure of your interview of or your uh, methodology so that it would not really cause um, undue stress to the participant. So it's not just an interview, yeah? It could be focus group, it could be survey, experiments. So I'm just giving an example. Um, who should be your respondent? Who will be your target? So making sure that everyone is included, right? Everyone in the population that is related to the topic is included. Um, and then that's the, how much incentive should I give? And we talk about how extreme incentive shouldn't be there because that will be an inappropriate uh, sort of conduct and it would look like as if it is a bribe and therefore that concept of undue influence comes in again. So I guess by internalizing all those fundamental principles of research ethics that I talked about just now, autonomy, beneficence, justice and integrity, we are really ensuring that our research are a, a credible one and one that does really don't cause any harms to other individuals. So we really need to, like, to take a look at this. And what we do from a uh, UMREC sort of um, angle is that we really look into your proposal, uh, sorry, your, your applications, just to see and ensure that, you know, um, nothing fishy is going on and making sure that, you know, we abide by these uh, principles um, and whatever outcome of uh, that particular research is a credible one, right? It is one that is conducted rather ethically. And I think by doing that, only then we can call ourselves a responsible and ethical sort of researcher. And um, I suppose I would like to conclude this session by saying this. So I'm, I ended up <coughs> a bit early, but I guess I want to conclude with this. 
So if you look at the slides, um, we see that, we, you know, we do research, right, all around the world. So our individual research endeavors is really a part of all these interconnected networks, right? So we build on each other's knowledge, we develop on each other's advances, and, you know, we share publications, we share research with everyone around the world. And if any of our contributions are inaccurate, if any of our contributions or our research is unethically acquired or an unethically concluded, right, or maybe it's questionable, then what, what happens is that we all bear the cost as researchers. So poor practices not only impact or not only affect our individual and, you know, reputations, but it also impact the reliability of all our collective efforts, right? So all our collective works would be questionable, right? So it will impact that reliability. And I guess the real questions is, you know, that we should really be asking ourselves as we're conducting research is that, you know, what would be my ethical considerations as I'm conducting my own research? Okay, so I guess that's it for my uh, my session, and I'm gonna pass it back to Sharon, or maybe you know questions that we might have. Thanks, Ryder. That was um, that was really amazing. Thank you for going through the whole breadth of, of research ethics um, so clearly. Thank you for the the great examples. Um, I don't know. Um, do we have any questions from our participants? Do you want to either raise your hands or just shout out? No, no question. No questions. I think too much information <laughs> overload. Um, but, you know, we're always happy to, um, again, um, answer your questions. And if you really have areas that, you know, when, when Ryder was speaking that you think, well, this is something I don't really understand or I'd really like to um, learn a little bit more about that. If you just write to us, I think we would be more than happy to tailor specific sessions around specific issues. If, if we're struggling with justice issues mm -hmm. or, or beneficence issues or even trying to address risk, um, just let us know. We, this is an ongoing um, conversation and we are happy to organize more chats. And you can see we're we a happy committee and, and we... Um, yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah, we are, right? And we love talking yeah. about questions. Um, we will take a bit of a break. I know that we have an amazing case study that Dr. Chai has, has prepared for us. And, um, and then there will be a short breakout into breakout groups so you can have short discussions and come back and, and talk about the case study. And that's just an amazing way to translate some of the things that you've heard today in theory into a practical um, case study. Um, before we break for a bit, let me just ask, Dr. Chai, do you want them to read the case study during the break or will you go through it? Um, when um, you will yeah, thank you, Dr. Sharon. So I think we will go through it together, like, you know, later on when we start, so that um, all of our participants over here can just take a break, like, you know, have their breakfast or a cup of coffee and then we will meet again like you know because later on for the case study so I would expect our participants to do most of the talking so they will need to break into the group and like you know discuss the, the case and after that later on we will meet again like you know in this main room and they will need to um, um, tell us like you know what they think what they thought about it the case and how we should actually like you know address like you know each of the case that we share. Okay, fantastic. So everybody, um, you have a nice break until 10.30 and we're all looking forward to hearing from you at the end of our session today. So um, um, over back to ADEC and we will be, um, we'll see you at 10.30, over. All right, thank you, Dr. Raida, Dr. Sharon. Uh, so we'll take a break, a 20 minute break. Uh, we'll meet back here uh, at 10.30 um and um with dr chai q i will um break uh, you guys into the breakout room thank you thank you
one in the chat room. Okay, Dr. Chai, we are ready. <laughs> okay, thank you, Pazala. <laughs> what about others? I think some of them are not back yet. <laughs> Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. So you, you want to wait for another five minutes or you just want to start? Maybe we can wait for a little bit while because like, you know, we need to brief the case before yeah, they go sure. into their chat room. Yeah. All right. Yeah, if you could also like, you know, we are starting action. part of our training workshop, um, I would like to welcome um, Dr. Chai Lei Cheng this morning to speak to us. I'm going to switch off my video because my internet is a bit unstable. Um, you know, Dr. Chai is, is the perfect person to take us through this case study. She has a wealth of experience. 
She is from the Institute of Biological Sciences at our Faculty of Science at University of Malaya. And she is the chairperson of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia Young Scientist Network. Um, she was an affiliate member in 2015, became a full member in 2016, and was subsequently elected as co-chair of the Science Integrity Working Group in 2016 for her persistent effort and excellent work in promoting research integrity in Malaysia. So Dr. Chai has been doing this for a long time, and she is actually one of the main authors of the Malaysia published and launched in 2018. Um, Dr. Chai herself is, is a very prolific researcher and her research focuses on food safety and microbiology. She is the vice chair of the technical working group of microbiology under the food analysis committee department of the chemistry under the Food Analysis Committee of the Department of Chemistry, Malaysia. And she has um, some extremely good linkages with industry and is, and, I, and is identified as a key opinion leader in the field of food safety and microbiology. Um, she has won a number of awards, the Malaspina International Award by the International Life Science Institute, and she was awarded the L'Oreal UNESCO Women in Science Award in 2018 for her great passion and achievements in science. And she was listed as one of the 25 Marie Claire Amazing Women in Malaysia and Prestige 40 Under 40 in 2019. Um, so with that, Thank you, Dr. Sharon. Thank you, Dr. Sharon, for the very kind introduction. So, good morning, everyone. So, for right now, I would like to actually run the case study as you have listened to um, Dr. Raida's um, presentation um, and also introduction, like, you know, to um, the ethics issue that we actually look into, like, you know, what UMREC has been doing and what UMREC, like, you know, um, concern of, like, you know, when we... Um, review your application, like you know, for research that involves um, human participants or human subject, um, not in the clinical field. So to help you all, like you know, to be able to see better and also to like you know apply what you have learned. So um, it will be more interesting to look into a case study whereby you can experience yourself, like you know, as a UMREC member. Um, someone who look into research ethics, like, you know, what do you need to do? So what is required, like, you know, in dissecting each of the case and what are the concerns every time when we brought up issues, like, you know, um, to the researchers on their research project, okay? So for the next um, 30 minutes later on, so we will split all of you, like, you know, into um, breakout sessions, like, you know, in, in, into a smaller breakout group that you will be discussing the case study, like, you know, among yourself and select, like, you know, um, one or two presenters to present and share your thoughts later on when we meet again back in this main um, discussion room. So let me share... Okay. So how do we conduct these sessions? So later on um, during the breakout session, so if possible, so I would like to urge all participants to actually turn your camera on so that like, you, know, you could have a more um, interactive um, sessions and discussion later on. Um, or else like, you know, it will be all the time that you look at your screen, which is all black and dark. So um, later on, so I will give you an introduction of the case. So this will take about like, you know, probably five minutes to read. And you could ask questions like, you know, uh, before we actually enter into each of your breakout um, room, whereby you'll be by yourself, like, you know, to lead and to do the discussion. So I will encourage that each um, breakout session to probably select a lead to, um, to, to, to guide the discussion. Okay, and another person like, you know, probably to write down, to record your um, response, your um, answer. So how um, we should do like, you know, for each of these um, case over here. So this breakout session 
will be for 30 minutes, um, hopefully not more than that. So you, there are quite a number of um, questions that we ask that you need to answer. Okay, so you should do it within the 30 minutes. So address the questions, assign one or two persons, like you know, to share your group's responses later on. Then you join back, like you know, into the main group. And assign one person also to help the group um, to manage time if possible. So have five minutes for each question at least, and also five minutes to conclude before you come back to the um, main, um, main group for the discussion. And what is more important, the most um, take part and share your thoughts, like, you know, um, during the, um, what is it, the breakout session later on. So after that, we will come back to the main room for collective. We lost you for a while. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, now yes. We we lost okay. you for a while. Which, which part? Which part you lose me? No, no, just a few seconds before. Ah, okay. All right. Okay. So just remember that, like you know, after the breakout session, when you join us again, like you know, in the main room, so we will invite each group to actually share your thoughts. So you need to assign probably one or two person to actually share what you have discussed, what you think about the case, and so on and so forth. So. Will do, do we will dissect okay. and um, you do not need to be very formal, so just do it casually. Can you hear me? Probably I will switch off your video, maybe. Yeah, I will switch off my video. Okay, I'll switch off my video. Probably this will be better. Okay. So let us look at the case. So I've shared the case on the chat. Box. Oh, it's still quite... So you Dr. Chai. Dr. Chai, maybe you can just check your internet for a while. Is that okay? Okay. Shall I just read the case for you, Dr. Chai, and then you can take it over? Yes, sure. Yeah, Sharon, if you can take over from here. Okay. So um, this is Dr. Chai's case, case one, and I'll just read through the case. Prof. Rama is the PI of a research project that aims to understand the living condition and status of elite. It was designed to explore the social network, lifestyle and employment of the illegal migrant population in Malaysia. Through this study, Prof Rama and his research team aimed to review the importance of social networking systems as an instrument that helps the illegal migrant population to improve their living in Malaysia as well as to highlight challenges and identify potential approaches to solve the illegal migrant issue in Malaysia. The three objectives of this study are to one, identify routes undertaken by the immigrants to enter Malaysia illegally, two, examine how social networks and local communities play a role in helping the illegal migrants to adapt and settle down in Malaysia, and three, understand the challenges and strategies undertaken by the illegal migrants to ensure economic survival in Malaysia. Okay. After several rounds of discussion with his research team, they have decided to add in another aspect to the project, which is to well as to assess the health and education status of the children of illegal migrants. 
And the study involves a number of things. First, there is an oral interview with the illegal migrants. So they're going to ask 20 illegal migrants for interviews. Secondly, they are also going to observe illegal migrants and visit their homes. Thirdly, they are going to conduct oral interviews with the children between the ages of 7 to 18 of the in, and um, the parents as well. So they're going to interview parents, they're going to interview children. Prof Rama and his team will recruit the respondents through two channels. So this is the recruitment strategy. Firstly, a close contact of Prof Rama will serve as a liaison to link to the other illegal immigrants. This close contact is also an illegal migrant currently living in Malaysia. And secondly, through local employers in the community, that have a relationship with the undocumented migrants in Malaysia. Prof. Rama has recruited two postgrad students to work and home visit. Okay, back to you, Dr. Chai. Hopefully your internet's a bit more stable now. Yeah, can you? Or are you speaking? We still can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So the questions that you need to discuss over here is that, um, what do you think about this project? So is there any benefits of this project? And I think um, basically you need to spend a lot more time also, like, you know, to discuss about the risk. So are there any risks, like, you know, to the students conducting the interview? What about risk to the illegal immigrants being interviewed? and the illegal immigrants population in Malaysia. What about the children, like, you know, the family of, like, you know, the illegal immigrants? So is there any extra harms to them? So because they are very, very vulnerable population over here that we are talking about. And what about the local employers and community who employ the illegal immigrants, like, you know, to do the, the, the job or the task? And what about the close contact or the liaison, uh, liaison that actually link you to the illegal immigrants um, for the study? So um, I want you to look into, because this project actually involves quite a number of stakeholders. So I want you to discuss and, and to think about the risk for each of the um, participants or the stakeholders of this research. So um, the third question over here, so I want you to also think about and discuss about the potential conflicts. Will there be any conflicts, issues, or ethical dilemmas associated with this study? And is there a way to actually mitigate them? Um, for UMREC, um, the main purpose is not to reject project, um, but to help like, you know, mitigating the risk, reduce the risk of each of the project so that they could do it um, without um, the high risk, like you know, that re uh, related or linked to the ethical um, set, um, elements or components of the project over here. Okay, so that's all for this project and um, of this case. So, any question that you want to ask? Is there any questions that you want to ask? If not, then can we split your into um, breakout sessions that you will now start to discuss about this case? Thank you, Dr. Uh, okay, thank you. So I think uh, with the number of people over here, so we split into two groups now. Okay, Dr. Chai. There number two groups here.
Hi Dr. Chai. Yes. Uh, can I confirm you are able to um, like join from group to group? Should I do it? I don't think so. <laughs> oh. Uh, uh, I think I'm a mistake. Ah, yes, yes, yes. I think I think I can. I think I can. Yes, okay. yes, yes. I can you hold it for a while? Let me reassign the breakout room. Okay. Um all right. Hold on. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. Uh, I make a mistake. So let me try again. <laughs> uh, oh. I could I could Dr. Sharon, uh, yes. uh, are you are you kicked out of the breakout room or something happened? No, nothing happened. I was just wondering, um, I can't uh, see the file in the chat anymore. Do you think right. you send it? Uh, let me post chat. it again. Yeah, sorry. You mean you can't see when you are in the breakout room? Is that it? That you uploaded doesn't see. Ah, okay, I have it now. All right, okay. All right. Um, is Dr. Chai here? No. All right. No. Um, Dr. Sharon, because I think not many participants anymore. So I'll just group uh, all of you in just one room. Oh, For okay. Now? Yeah, I think yeah. we can. Um, we've been having a bit of a chat on our WhatsApp group, so right. not to worry too much. I think um, we will probably have a more panel style discussion. So if there's no breakout room, then um, or if there's no participation, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Chai, Dr. Raida, and I will just have a chat. Like we will simulate an ethics um, yeah, meeting. Sure. Uh, so should I go into the breakout room anyway now? Um, maybe because the chair is there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Ryder, you're uh, muted. Ah, uh, so sh we should join the breakout room. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe just join first. Okay. All right. Uh, So I think it's better that we actually join like you know in the main group over here because the other people they are not they are not here. Okay, so this is so this is the normal case, like you know, when we UM Rec meet, so when we have a case like this that we think that there are some concern and we want to actually um um, discuss about like you know the ethics part like you know the risk the benefits so these are, are the 
common questions that we ask usually like you know in UM Rec. So we just pretend that we are all like you know UM Rec member and this is the project that came out and we are all like you know having dilemma whether if like you know to approve this case or not to approve. So if we do not approve, so what type of um, improvement that we need the researchers to do like you know for their project. So probably Wansawa, you would like to lead this um, discussion? Oh, um, okay, thank you, Dr. Chai. I'm very novice. <laughs> 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 so on this area, even my, even my supervisor was here, I think, <laughs> tell our comments. So, but, okay. Okay, from the case study given, um, so we, we are not very clear whether this study has been, uh, has been given uh, approval from uh, at this committee. So there's no... Not yet, yeah. Not yet, not yet. Uh? Oh. All right, this, so, okay. Um, objective of the study, to identify, to examine, to understand. And then in between, it is decided to put another aspect of the project to understand the family structure. And then the study involved uh, oral observation and observation and home visit. Okay. Um, from my point of view, this project is uh, uh, is very good, but uh, but it involves illegal immigrants. So that part for me is quite quite sensitive because uh, first. Uh, Maybe you would say earlier, it's about uh, the kind of questions and then uh, that you're going to ask them. Uh, again, it's really reflect on their uh, um, ability to understand the question. And then, uh, of course, they're going to bring uh, the, the, the bahasa that's going to be used, whether it's Malay in English or if the Malay. I mean, you need to really uh, have a... Um, Hadwi uh, Bahasa lah, going to have an English and uh, VM version and to ensure that the, the Bahasa version is really uh, really uh, on, on point lah, it's, it's the same meaning with the uh, uh, English version to ensure the, the, the objective of the studies meet and then uh, first the English and VM version and then the second one I think uh, the studies also need to have um, um, the illegal illegal in, uh, uh, migrant. I'm not sure whether they are the uh, the 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 research uh, SOP procedures. Whether they need to get all the information required because we are in the pandemic uh, endemic situation. All the SOP procedure need to be addressed, and then. Uh, the and then the third part maybe the um, the student who were conducting the interview their their yeah. capacity and ability and how they going to address the, the matters uh, correctly so for me that is my 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 concern lah about, about about this study and then this the, is something the, the, yeah hmm. this is something very very common like you know in uh, hmm. I think. In UM, not just UM, probably in a lot of universities, like you know, um, when the study is not in the clinical field, like you know, in social science field, a lot of people will see will, will take like you know the risk of research as neglectable, like you know, it's it's very insignificant, very, very little. And most people will not have this thought, like you know, that there might be risk, like you know, that involved. Um, or associate with this type of research. Mm. So as we could see over here, like, you know, this is like, you know, a case where, whereby, like, you know, it's on the extreme side that we really see because it's illegal immigrant. Mm. So mm. illegal immigrant as like, you know, um, a vulnerable population. Breaking. The try is breaking. Population. So, um, but yes, yes. So this would also like, you know, put a risk on our researchers, like, you know, the ethical responsibility and also leave. Responsibility. Dr. Chai, you are breaking up again. Yeah. That you have, like, you know, a split. Better if 
<laughs> I, I, I will, I'm off my video. Okay, yeah. probably this will be better. So therefore, like, you know, there are a lot of risks involved in this research. So the first thing usually we will go into it is that, remember Dr. Mm -hmm. Raida mentioned about beneficence and non-maleficence, like, you know, of any research. So the first question, I guess, like, you know, we need to look into is, is what motivates this research? Is there any benefits of doing this research? Oh, we're losing you again, Dr. Chen. Mm -hmm. So... The first, there are any benefits of this research? So, do we gain something from doing this research academically, uh, intellectually? So, and also probably towards um, our country policy and so on and so forth. So, if anyone could chip in, like you know, what what do you think? Do 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 you think that? Is 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 it important? Are you asking us about thinking about the benefit to do to the population themselves? What what we think about in terms of of benefits? Yes. Yeah. So I think that's a yes. really interesting question because um, for me at least when we do normal research when we don't think about vulnerable populations um, of course the research is beneficial to me right because I get some good data and I add to the knowledge of the the general subject matter and if I can publish it then it's super beneficial to me because hopefully I can get a promotion um, but I do think that when we look at vulnerable populations um, we really need to ask ourselves, you know, is it enough that that is an interesting question? Is it enough that that question will give us some information that we can publish? Or do we really need to think about what good will it, what good will come of it to that population? You know, do they gain anything if, if we publish how they come into the country? You know, is, is that even more of a risk? Then, you know, the authorities will know how to find them. So I would really be looking for greater benefit to a vulnerable population. And I would say that as a researcher, my duty is higher when I'm thinking about the benefits um, over. I think we can also add something to that, if I can just add to what um, Dr. Sharon has mentioned. Um, one of the things that I mentioned just now was actually on the dignitary harm. So if we're looking at, you know, if we're looking at, if we have a, a funder who's actually wanting us to do all these big projects, um, we need to, to look back at what's the main purpose of doing this particular project particular project? Is it really about diplomatic relation between our country and um, the countries of the immigrants? Or are we really looking into developing and helping them out, you know, for a better policy, perhaps, uh, for a better life in, in Malaysia in this case? So I think we need to look into the kind of harm as well, what, what we can do, and what's the main purpose of the study? And I guess if we think about that particular harm, then we go back to what Sharon mentioned just now that, you know, it's really about you know, what benefits we can gain if we were to conduct this study for the immigrants um, and not just on, on behalf of the researcher. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, you know, there are a lot of, like, you know, um, elements that is involved, like, you know, with this case. So in terms of benefits, so is it enough, like, you know, for to justify for such a research that involves, like, you know, this very vulnerable population, not just, like, you know, the illegal immigrant, but also their family that involves children. So what harm would they do, like, you know, to the kids over here? And probably perhaps, like, you know, um, Dr. Sharon would probably um, be enlightened us a little bit in terms of law and legal part. 
So how do we balance ourselves, like, you know, researcher over here and, and being a good scientist? So in case, like, you know, there's this case whereby one of your interviewee, so one of the illegal immigrants um, were involved, like, you know, in one of the whatever illegal case, and the police came to you, could you share with me where is their hideout? So you have interviewed them before. So what is your stand? So do you, like, you know, wow for this is, research confidentiality and we have signed the agreement that I would not reveal. But what about by, by, by legal? So do we have to reveal? Oh no, thank you. Such a difficult question. <laughs> um, I think no, I think that's a really, really good question. And it's something that again, we need to think about before we start the research. Cause once we've collected the data and we're keeping it and then the police come to us for the data, it's very difficult to manage. So I think ethically speaking, if you know, let's say you're, we haven't thought about it yet and we collect this data and we have the addresses of these illegal immigrants and they're in our documents and we've promised them that we will keep it confident. We say we will keep it confidential unless required by the authorities. Um, so if the authorities come, you legally actually have to give it to them. And so we have to be so careful what information we are keeping, especially when we're dealing with vulnerable populations. And if we're dealing with illegal migrants, their whole existence is illegal. Anything they do is potentially illegal, right? Because they're not supposed to be here. So then our sort of our warning bells must be on level super extreme, right? Number level five out of five. Um, and even if you as an individual, let's say I say, okay, no, I'm not going to tell the police. I don't mind. I'll get arrested. Um, I suspect the university also has liabilities and they will force us to release the information. Um, so I would be very careful. And as an ethics committee member, I would want um, to alert the researchers that they should really not be keeping any identifiable information. If you're going to the house, don't have any documentation about where you Forms. You shouldn't be collecting their names anywhere. It shouldn't be documented so that they can be found. Um, so the police shouldn't even know what geographical area you're going into. So you can say you're going into three kampongs in, um, in Malaysia, in an urban or rural or south or north. Um, I, would be, I would be so careful about um, thinking about how I, I store my data because um, yeah, the minute something is illegal or you have illegal activities going on, and, and they're actually protecting themselves, but you are the one that I am the researcher going in and creating the danger for them because suddenly now their location is, is documented, their names are documented, right? Um, so it really shouldn't be me that is creating this added legal risk for them over. Yeah, there, there is something that like, you know, is my concern all this while, like, you know, when you look at all of this application, like, you know, to conduct research with illegal immigrants, trying to understand their living, trying to understand, like, you know, how um, to get information, like, you know, as an input, like, you know, to improve our policy. So this is something, like, you know, that, that we as a researcher need to think about when we Come, uh, when we design such um, a, a type of study or research. So I think it, it is only fair when we interview our interview, we like, you know, this illegal immigrant, our subject of research, that we must inform them of the potential risk uh, we might expose them to. So including such a scenario, if it happened, so what would my stand be, the researcher's stand? So then the, um, the illegal immigrant or your subject um, would need to make a decision whether if they would like to participate in this research and take the risk or not to. So if your participants think that, like, you know, it is a risk that's too high for them to take, so you should let them be running. So this is um, something we talk about justice and fairness in this case, like, you know, how it will come in. And that's why, like, you know, for UMREC, we are very very, very super concerned. 
Should we turn off our video? Yes. Would that help? Yeah, and I think one Sorry. of the things that Juan Sawa actually brought up also on the language, right? So what are the bahasa that we need to use? Like, you know, this depend on our illegal immigrant, whether if they understand um, the scenario, so they understand what is this study about. So if uh, incentives is given, then the incentive will become a question So, so you am right. I will actually agree with unfair or unjust condition um, put towards to them. So in this case, so um, how do you deal and how do you mitigate the risk will become a question over here that we want to talk about. So these are a little bit about like, you know, the justice part of it. So when it comes to risk, so a lot of people never think about what about, because we talk about like, you know, a lot about the risk to our human subject, to the illegal um, migrant um, community. But what about the risk? to our students. Such a study and whose responsibility is it to protect and to ensure that our students are safe when they or our researchers are safe when they do such a, such a work? Do we have um, a policy to actually ensure it? So this is something very, very important also. Whatever research that we do, there will be risk. So significant major or minor risk. So all the risks involved or associated, we need to sit down and really think about it and find ways to actually prevent um, the harm from happening or to mitigate the risk. So in this case, do you think that our students will, or any scenario that our student might be facing a higher risk or might be in danger? Hmm. From my point of view, Dr. 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 Chai, I think for the for the students or for the for, for those who, who are collecting all the data and 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 as long as they are students for me, uh it's quite uh it's quite a risk for them because uh first uh on the authority part, as a student they have like um they as a student they don't have um uh, resor uh, resources that good in terms of uh, networking, the contact number, the, the, the person you're going to defend them. And then the second part is actually on their maturity, on how to deal with that. And then um, the kind of, uh, of, of policy or, or guidance or, or guideline that can help them uh, to um, to help them in, in whatever situation uh, that going to, I think, to risk uh, they may have uh, a risk uh, to go through all the, the processes. So for me, it's quite risky. And then for the study, I think this kind of study is quite, um, uh, it's quite, I'm not sure, but well, um, because the, 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 the respondents uh, and then uh, the, the students are going to collect all the data, um, it's quite, for me, it's quite risky. Again, I agree with uh, Dr. Chai. Uh, uh, the student need to have a kind of training, the kind of like a kit or uh, information uh, guideline be given to them when and how to deal with such situation that might cause danger to them. Yeah, so this is something that, that I have always been concerned. So where do you conduct your interview? So who will go with you? So... Um, if you need to do, because this study, they probably, they will need to do a visit, like, you know, to the house. So where 
the house is so and, and all sorts of questions that need to be answered um, I think there's one question that all I always ask so whose responsibility is it like you know to ensure safety of students so what about university as a whole so do we have a responsibility also to ensure that students safety is actually protected and be prioritized. So this is something probably beyond like, you know, the ethical committee to discuss about this one. So it'll be something probably um, we need a larger platform to actually discuss this, whether if a policy, a guidelines is actually required um, for this work. So in to, to save up uh, to, what is it to, um, we, we are always concerned like, you know, UMREC is not a committee to actually um, without any reason stop research from running or reject project, uh, reject um, research, particularly when the research receive funding from external party to run it. So only after that they apply like, you know, for UMREC um, um, approval to run the project. So with the money already come in, research money already come in. So we always focus on how could we mitigate the risk when we have, I mean, after we have identified the risk over here. So how should we mitigate this risk? So what are the extra precaution need to put in? What are the SOP need to be built or developed, like, you know, to, to prevent the harms that we have predicted to ha uh, that, that will happen, like, you know, from, um, I mean, to prevent, like, you know, the harm and so on and so forth. So that will be something that we need to do next. So, SOP, steps, precaution. So how should we mitigate this risk? Yeah, because at the end, even they are our students, they are our responsibilities and it, uh, it, it can implicate our image and if there is something that happened to them, of course, the university need, still need to answer on that. I think the, the, I think the, the you need to have a holistic um, a view on the this part. So, yeah, for me, we can to have, need to have uh, a holistic view on the kind of risk that that the that the researcher might have to, uh, during the, the the processes of research. That maybe from different kind of 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 area, different kind of risk that we we need to to attend to them separately. Hmm. Um, yeah, maybe if I could just add to that. So um, I'm just going to go back a bit about, you know, the students and the risk that they face. Um, so one of it is what Dr. Chai mentioned is an SOP. But um, on the other hand, um, as a researcher, if the students are going to be um, our research um, assistant, then they do need to be trained as to how to do research with the immigrants, especially for those who have never done it before. Um, you know, there's a lot of different sort of ways to learn about, say, interviewing skills, right? You need to be patient, you need to listen, but they also need to learn in depth about who are they interviewing. So learning about uh, the culture of the immigrants, you know, to understand how they're like um, is very, very important. So, um, you know, in order to understand, you know, um, the things that they might say during um, the interview or perhaps, you know, um, the things that might occur during the interview. And before we actually conduct it, I think we need to be, train in terms of and we need to increase our knowledge in terms of who we are interviewing so that's one way to actually mitigate that that sort of risk uh, before we actually looking into the SOP itself so you know the need to be patient uh, perhaps the way that you even talk to them is a bit different as opposed to the way that we talk to you know Malaysian for instance right um, and uh, I think there are two countries that we're talking about just now, uh, Indonesia and Cambodia. So maybe um, they're, they're very different from each other. And the way that we talk to people, the immigrants from Cambodia and the uh, immigrants from Indonesia would be very, very different as well. So if we, as a researcher, if we're not prepared, so if the students are not prepared to actually talk to people from different cultural background, that could pose a lot of risk as yes, well. Yes, I do agree. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, go back, going back to the SOP that Dr. Chai had talked about, we need to be prepared on all the risks. Yep. Thanks.
Okay, anyone else who would like to add to that in terms of the SOP and risk? Currently, uh, currently, Dr. Raina, currently we don't have that kind of risk that the local university has a risk committee that are under, under uh, corporate strategy. Uh, I'm not sure whether this uh, kind of risk they take into account as a kind of risk that we sh should consider as, as an important uh, part of of the as a researcher. Uh, we need to, uh, so going back to what uh, Ponsalwa mentioned, um, so we really need to look into our participant, who they are, and how we can protect them. So in the case of the case study, it was the immigrants, right? But if you're actually conducting with anyone, let's say you're yes. conducting can with... You the... Yeah, we can hear you, Dr. Chai. So let's say if we're conducting a research uh, with a particular organization, then there must be um, a way to find out how can we minimize risk for the participant. So in the case of a hostile, toxic work environment, how are we going to um, actually protect them? Um, and the clear answer is, of course, on the issue of confidentiality. Um, so going back to what Dr. Sharon mentioned about what if the police ask us about this uh, illegal immigrants. So I guess the best way is to not keep any personal information, right? On the one hand, we want to keep everyone anonymous. On the other hand, we don't want to collect as much um, as in the case uh, study that we're talking about right now, because it's a very sort of sensitive issue that we're talking about. We also don't really want to pressure you know, these people to, to participate. Um, so as a student researcher, for example, in this, in this case study, um, you, you need to train the student to not pressure the immigrants if they don't want to participate. So sometimes we want the data, right? We really, really want it. And it's really, really valuable. But in a sense, we have to read the body language you can see that they're not very comfortable in answering the question and they don't really want to participate. So it's our job as a researcher to actually confirm that, to actually ask again, are you comfortable? Um, do you not want to participate in the study? So there must be an opportunity for them to voice that out. Okay. All right, maybe Dr. Chai wants to add to that. Or Dr. Sharon? Yeah, um, I think that these are all such amazing insights. And I, I totally agree with you, you know, that um, when we send students out, I mean, it's one thing for the primary investigator or the co-investigators to know and, and understand how to do this. But we really do have a duty to train our student researchers or the people on the ground, if they're not going to be us, to really be mindful of all these things and to do, again, the due diligence, as, as Dr. Ryder has, noticed, has noted, to know the communities, to know who we're going to be talking to and what the potential sort of challenges are and to make sure that our researchers or our students So I think in terms of protecting the students, it's always a good idea if you are anticipating any sort of an issue, either the students may land up, you know, trying to... Um, unfairly or, or, or lean on, on participants to take part. Or alternatively, if participants, if you have students talking to high-level uh, corporate managers or people who are very, very, um, you know, um, influential, if they land up being difficult with the students, if the students have problems, to actually have a pathway where the students can come back to the researchers or that they know what to do, that they don't panic and that that's sort of, of taken care of because you can then create a lot of distress when the students find that they cannot handle the interview and, and they're not quite sure what to do. So there is this really important discussion to be had. And I really agree with Dr. Chai as to how we, we train and, and protect our students. Because we do this when we, in, in science or, or medical research, if you know students are going to be dealing with We make sure that um, all the researchers, especially the students, are, are well covered and well trained. And we should really be, be thinking about this in terms of occupational safety and health as well. Over. And, um, and yeah, poor Dr. Chai is, is making all these um, extremely insightful comments. I'll read them since we're recording. 
Um, she says justice and fair treatment is important. We do not see our subjects in which they are illegal immigrants as having a lower hierarchy. And I think that is, is such a, a great insight. And invite or include an expert in foreign culture in the project is highly recommended. Um, and I would agree, you know. Um, and, and the other thing that is really important and worth thinking about, and maybe we can do a session on it, is, is community engagement. If you're going into vulnerable populations to know who to talk to, who are the experts, you know, who are the NGOs that might be working in this area, uh, maybe talking to the UNHCR. Is there anything else we want to discuss in relation to this particular case study? I'm really sorry, you know, um, Juan Salva, that our all of us are struggling with our internet connections today. Yeah, yeah, it's okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> we understand. Yeah. And so Dr. Chai has also highlighted that prevention is important. Always do a risk assessment before the start of this project. And I agree with her. And, you know, it's worthwhile, re regardless of how low or high risk your project is. So exactly, we... We are both on the same wavelength, um, you know, because obviously this case study is a very high risk project because you have um, people who are illegal. You have migrant communities who are vulnerable. We are also thinking about talking to children. We're actually going to their homes and maybe we're asking them for health information. So this is super high risk, but any sort of. map them out to say what do you think are the possible risks or the things that might happen which are challenging and to be able to put into place before the research starts some measures to to protect or some pathways or or to know when to escalate it back to the PI is is so important and as Dr. Ryder has pointed out we, we are not just thinking about research ethics in relation to how we treat our participants but it's really about how we treat each other as well which is so important in a research team. Um, uh, Ryder, do you have anything else to add? Um, nothing much, I guess, but I, I really hope that, you know, the case study and all those uh, fundamentals that we talk about just now um, really provide sort of um, some, at least some trigger, right, um, for everyone to at least start thinking about the harmful thing that we can do. So in this case, it's a, a very high risk, of course, and we want to mitigate um, as much risk as possible. Um, but even if it's in terms of very simple study, we shouldn't take it for granted. We shouldn't say that, yeah, this is very low risk. I'm not going to think about um, anything. You know, it's, it's not going to be a high risk sort of study. I, I don't think we should start any research um, having that in mind. I always believe that a good ethical and sound research, you need to start with you know, thinking about what are the, what are the risks, what is the impact of um, my methodological sort of uh, my chosen methodology um, in uh, my uh, in in as to you know in, in terms of the procedure that I'm gonna take on, right? What will be the risk that I'm taking? Um, will, will it impact the, the participants in terms of how they feel? In terms of um, you know what will be the impact after you have finished? your interview or your, your experiments or your survey. So we need to think about what happened during, um, before, as well as after. So we can't just think it like, you know, we were interviewing this person at this moment of time, and I'm just going to think about the race right there and then. We also have to think about what's going to happen afterwards. Are they going to think about what, what is being discussed uh, during that particular time? So for these immigrants, for instance, um, so even though you know they might feel uncomfortable, but they still want to participate, you um, there must be a referral pathway for them because um, they might not feel good after that, right? They might not sleep at night thinking that, you know, the researcher has promised me of my confidentiality, but is it really true? Are they really going to do that? So they're going to have all this in their mind, and they might not go to sleep thinking that the police might come anytime, right? So we need to think about that as well, uh, so that we can actually protect uh, those participants. Okay, over? Yeah, totally, Ryder. And um, Dr. Chai has added a few more comments to note that social science research 
does have risks. And in fact, they are not any lower compared with any medical research. And that is really true. And she says that the harms or risks could be more serious. This case study really demonstrates it. And she says interviews or unfair treatment, particularly to vulnerable populations such as children, could have long-term impacts on them. Yeah, so it's, it's so true. And in this particular case, people could land in prison, you know, and if we're talking about how immigrants travel from one place to another, their social support system, they may lose those whole systems. And we know that in this country, we don't necessarily treat migrants very well. And whatever little support they have, if we destroy that, it can be so profoundly um, horrible for them. So, yeah, I do agree with Dr. Chai that social science research really can be very, very impactful. And, um, and I think one of the things we try to do at UMREC is, as again, as both Dr. Chai and Ryder have pointed out, we're not here to stop people from doing research. We're just trying to make sure that when we do research, everybody is is sort of protected and that we think about this research very carefully together with the research came through um, UMREC, we would probably invite the researchers to come and talk to us. And then we would really go through things. And if we feel ourselves that we need more expert opinion, we might invite an expert on um, illegal immigrants to come and talk to us as well. And the process is more of advising researchers to try and help you create the, to shape the best research project you can, not just for yourself as a researcher, but also for the research participants, the research community, and the, the community at large as, as well. So I think that's how we see our role. Um, so I think given the, the, the huge um, challenges we've had in terms of um, participants as well as our internet. Um, I'm going to invite, hopefully, Dr. Chai's um, internet will allow her to say a few small words, a few final words. Then I'll invite Ryder to say a few final words and, um, and we'll close this session today. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Sharon. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, I think like, you know, um, I hope that this will give like, you know, a very brief overview of like, you know, what ethics, um, research ethics are about. And for UMREC, uh, what our roles, um, what our role are, and also like, you know, the challenges that um, we face. So all of us, like, you know, researchers face all of these, like, you know, um, issue or ethical dilemma. There's oft always like, you know, um, or oftentimes like, you know, that we do not have such thing as like, you know, what is the right thing to do or wrong thing to do, but probably what is the most appropriate way of doing things. So do not feel um, shy, like, you know, to come forward if you have problem or you face like, you know, ethical issue, like, you know, with your research. So UMRAC is um, here, like, you know, to listen to your problem and also like, you know, to sit down together with you, um, helping, like, you know, to solve the, the problem or the issue you face. So together, so we could make our research um, better and to create also a safer environment for our researchers um, to conduct their research. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chai. Dr. Ryder, your last words. Okay, I, I don't have much to say, but maybe if I could just reiterate back what I mentioned in my presentation um, just now, that um, our role as a researcher is you know, really we, what we are is that we're really part of all this interconnected network, right? So what we do with our research, we share with other people around the world. And like I said, if any of our study does not abide to, you know, the, uh, the ethical side, um, if our contributions are very, very inaccurate because we, um, you know, we change some of the data just to make it look good, then as a researcher, we all bear the costs. We all bear the costs, uh, you know, among us uh, around the world. So we hope that whatever that we do in um, UMREC, um, that would it would help a lot of people in a sense to conduct a more ethical research. And I think they said this many times that our job is not to stop you from doing research, but to do more of an ethical one. Okay, so that's it. Thank you.
Okay, thanks, Dr. Rada. I'm going to try and be brave and have my video on for this last bit. So thank you very much um, for the participants who stayed with us to the bitter end. Um, thank you so much to um, Dr. Chai and Dr. Raida for spending their morning with us. Um, you know, an added note, Dr. Chai is on, on holiday. So this is really heroic. She's spending her morning on leave with us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to um, the OMREC administrator, Zaza, for organizing this. Thank you for generally keeping our whole um, ethics committee going. Thank you to ADEC for inviting us and for the participants as well. And as I said earlier, we're always happy to talk about specific things. So, or that you have heard many people are, are struggling with, just let us know. And we are more than happy to shape a workshop to that extent. So, yay, all three of us are on. Maybe we can just have a, yeah, a last wave. I don't know. Does ADAC want to take a picture? Sure. Okay. Does everybody want to put on their... Oh. I, I think we just have a few person left here. Yeah? That that yeah, it's okay. Um, I heard that UMREC is hosting a ethic research workshop in December. Yeah. Zaza, yeah, do you maybe, want to... maybe you can promote that here too, if you want. Yeah, yeah. I'll give it over to Zaza to promote. Uh, yes, uh, UMREC will be organizing an for two days for today's ethics workshop on uh, that will be held on 7 and 8 of December. So all are welcome. Um, but please uh, do register early so we can we can uh, we can do the arrangement lah. Can okay, that's all. All right, uh, can we have everyone smile? All right, one, two, three. All right, hold on. Let me take another one. All right, one, two, three. All right. Um, is it possible for the materials to be shared with us or... Um, you know, just in case um, any other participant watching this video uh, wants a reference um, to what we are talking about. Um, I'm quite happy to share, but maybe we can just ask um, Zaza to check with our chair first. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll be sending uh, Pan Zaza an email to request for the materials. All right. Thank you. 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 Thank